was covered in a number of river valleys and mountain peaks. The geography was rugged, but the winds were mild. Thus many parts of the area were shrouded in fog all year round. The pair took an arrow straight path in the direction the left arm pointed, passing through a small hamlet. The thatched roof mud hut they encountered was encircled several times by bamboo fencing. A colourful variety of chickens and chicks wandered in and out of the yard, pecking at grains of rice, while a large, brightly coloured cock stood on one foot on the roof, shaking its comb, turning its head vigilantly, proudly overlooking the surroundings. Fortunately, no one here kept dogs. After all, the hamlet residents probably ate meat a couple of times a year at most, and would hardly have enough bones left over to feed one. Ahead of the hamlet, the road forked into three different directions. Two of the trails were well-worn and covered in footprints. It was clear that people frequently travelled down these roads, but the last was overgrown with weeds. A square stony slab stood crookedly at its head. The slab was old and weather-beaten, and dry, withered grass stuck out from a crack which ran the length of the rock. Two large characters were carved on the stone slab, which appeared to give the name of the place that the road led to. With effort, it was possible to see that the bottom character read City, but the top character was complex and made of many strokes. The crack just happened to run through it, and many nearby bits of rock had been chipped off. The ocean bent down, pulled out the mess of grass, and stared at it for a long time but the identity of the character still eluded him. Unfortunately, the left arm was pointing right down this particular path. Maybe we should ask the villagers, Wei Wuxian said. Lanangji nodded. Of course, Wei Wuxian didn't expect his friend to make the inquiries. He immediately put on a big smile and walked toward a few farmer women who were busy scattering rice for the chickens. Some of the women were old, and some were young, but all grew nervous when they saw an unfamiliar young man approaching and looked as though they wanted to toss aside their baskets and flee inside. Only after Wei Wuxian said a few smiling words did they gradually calm down and shyly replied to him. When he pointed at the slab of rock and asked a question, all of their faces turned uniformly pale, and only after a great deal of hesitation did they begin to answer him stammering and gesticulating. All the while, they refused to look at Lan Wangji, who was standing near the stone, any more than necessary. Wei Wuxian listened attentively, one corner of his mouth uplifted the entire time. Once they were finished and the subject changed, the woman returned to their original colour, gradually relaxed and smiled at him artlessly. From afar, Lan Wangji stared at them, and waited for a long, long time, but Wei Wuxian showed no intention of returning. Slowly, he lowered his head and began to kick at a small rock near his feet. This unfortunate rock was flipped over and flipped over again for a great deal of time. When Lan Wangji lifted his head again, he even saw Wei Wuxian pull something out from his robes and give it to the woman who had spoken the most. Lan Wangji stood in place with a blank expression until he could no longer stand it. But just as he was preparing to walk over, Wei Wuxian finally put his hands behind his back and began to stroll back. Standing next to Lan Wangji again, he said, Hong Kong Jun, you should have gone over there. They were keeping rabbits in the yard. Lan Wangji displayed no reaction to his teasing, appearing indifferent. What did you learn? he asked. This road goes toward Yi City. The first character carved on the stone steel is Yi. Yi, as in Sha Yi? Lanongji asked. Yes and no, Wei Wuxian replied. Explain. That's the correct character, but the meaning is wrong. It's not Yi, as in Sha Yi, but Yi, as in Yi Zhuang. 
They stepped onto the path, covered in a thicket of weeds, leaving the stone steel behind them. Where is Shinze? Those women told me that ever since ancient times, six or seven out of every ten people living in the city have had short lives. Either their lifespan was short to begin with, or they were violently murdered. There were always a lot of yijong in the city to house the bodies. On top of that, the city is known for building coffins and crafting paper money and other burial items. Whether an artisan of the city built coffins or crafted paper goods, the craftsmanship was always exquisite. That's how the city got its name. Dry grass and scattered rocks littered the road, obscuring the deep ditches. As Wei Wuxin walked and talked, Lan Longji's gaze remained attentively glued to his friend's feet. The woman said the people in the hamlet very rarely go to Yi City, and Yi City's residents rarely leave except to deliver goods, Wei Wuxin said. In the past few years, they haven't seen so much as a shadow emerge from the place. The road's already been abandoned for a long time. No wonder it's so hard to walk along. Then, Lanonji asked, What else is there? We wish in reply. What did you give them? Oh, that's what you were talking about. The rouge. When We wish in was in Qinghe, he had bought rouge off of that fake Taoist priest shortly before making inquiries into Xing Lurich and had been carrying it with him all this time. If you ask someone a lot of questions, you have to give them a gift to thank them for their trouble. I was going to give them some silver, but they got scared and didn't want to take it. I found that they liked the smell of the rouge. They didn't seem as though they've used that type of thing before, so I gave it to them. After a pause, he continued, Hang Jun, why are you looking at me like that? It's not as though that box of rouge is especially high quality, and I'm nothing like how I was before. I used to always carry a whole pile of jewelry and flowery things to give to the ladies. I didn't have anything else to give them, and it's better than nothing. As though awoken from an unpleasant memory, Lanongji frowned and slowly turned his head. The weeds along the difficult road slowly thinned calling away on either side of the path. The road also gradually widened, but the fog grew thicker and thicker. The left hand curled back into a fist as a dilapidated city gate appeared at the end of the road. Paint was peeling off the watchtower near the entrance, and shingles were missing from its roof. In fact, a whole corner of the roof had fallen, rendering the structure unusually ugly and decrepit. Someone had graffitied the city walls, and the red of the gates, whose nails had begun to rust and blacken one by one, had practically faded to white. The doors had been left ajar, as though someone had pushed them open just a crack and slipped inside. Anyone could sense that the city was an eerie place merely by standing outside. A place where demonic spirits danced and ran wild. As Wei Wuxin approached along the road, he sized up his surroundings. The feng shui here is awful, he commented as he neared the gates. Lan Hongji nodded slowly. The mountains are barren and the water violent. Yi City was surrounded by sheer cliffs and high mountains. They leaned heavily toward the city at their center, appearing overwhelming and oppressive as though they would collapse at any moment. Encircled in all directions by these enormous black mountains, situated inside gloomy white fog, the city seemed more like a ghostly monster than ghosts and monsters. Merely standing in the city was enough to smother someone's chest in a blanket of malaise and send fear prickling through their nerves. This place had an intense air of menace. Since ancient times, there had been a saying that illustrious heroes bring glory to their hometowns. The opposite saying had an equally long history. Due to location and terrain, 
Some places simply possessed bad feng shui. The smell of rot swirled around them, and the people who lived in those places tended to live short lives and die premature deaths. Everything was unfavorable. If their ancestors had put down roots there, the rot grew even further inside their descendants' bones. Moreover, strange phenomena flourished in these places. Corpse transformations, fierce ghosts returning to their bodies, and the like were several times more common than elsewhere. Obviously, Yi City was exactly such a place. These places were usually located in relatively remote areas, beyond the control of cultivators. Of course, cultivators didn't want to deal with them either, as doing so was extremely troublesome, even worse than dealing with an aquatic abyss. Aquatic abysses could be chased away, but it was very difficult to change a place's feng shui. If no one came crying at their doors, every clan simply turned a blind eye and feigned ignorance. Leaving home was the resident's best solution, but if someone's family had lived in a remote area for many generations, it was very difficult for them to summon the determination to move away. Even if six or seven out of 10 residents were short-lived, it was still possible that you were among the other three or four who weren't, so they could bear it. As the pair arrived at the gate, they exchanged glances. There was a creak, and the gate's hinges, unable to bear the load, complained loudly as the two misaligned doors slowly opened. Before their eyes were neither the carts and horses of heavy city traffic nor fierce ghosts ready to pounce. There was only white filling the heavens and blanketing the earth as far as the eye could see. The fog which covered the city was several times thicker than the fog outside. Only through strenuous effort could they make out the arrow straight thoroughfare before them. There were buildings lining the street on either side, but they detected not a single trace of a townsperson. The pair subconsciously narrowed the distance between them before entering the city. It was still daytime, but the city was silent. Not only was human speech entirely absent, but bizarrely, no echoes of dogs' barks or chickens' croons could be heard either. However, since the left hand had pointed them to this destination, it would have been stranger if the city hadn't been weird. They walked along the thoroughfare for a while, the deeper they travelled into the city, the thicker the fog grew, permeating the place with its sinister presence. In the beginning, with effort, it was possible to see up to ten steps ahead. But later, it became impossible to distinguish even the silhouette of anything over five steps away. At last, they couldn't even see their fingers when they stuck their hands out in front of them. As Wei Wuxian and Lan Longji walked, they moved closer and closer. Only when they were pressed shoulder to shoulder were they able to make out each other's faces. An unbidden thought arose in Wei Wuxian's mind. If someone took advantage of this fog and quietly placed themselves between us, turning the two of us into a trio, I'm afraid we wouldn't even notice. Right then, he accidentally kicked something beneath his feet. Lowering his head to examine it, he found himself unable to tell what it was. Beowishin pulled on Lan Longji's hand in order to prevent him from wandering too far ahead alone, then stopped and squinted at the object. A head with wide open eyes and an angry expression broke through the fog and into his line of sight. The head had a man's face with large eyes and thick eyebrows. Two abnormally thick circles of rouge colored his cheeks. When Wei Wuxian had kicked his head, he had almost sent it flying, and thus he knew how much it weighed. Something so light couldn't be a real human head. He picked it up and squeezed it. A big section of the cheek collapsed, and his fingers rubbed off a considerable amount 
of rouge. It was made of paper. The paper head was remarkably true to life, and though the makeup was exaggerated, his features were fine and delicately made. E City specialized in the production of burial goods, so naturally their paper effigies were well crafted. Effigies had different purposes. For example, some were meant to substitute for the bodies of the dead. The popular belief was that if they were burned and offered to the dead, then the effigies would be able to take their place in hell and suffer the mountains of knives and the boiling oil vats in their stead. Other effigies depicted beautiful servant girls who would wait upon the dead in the afterlife, massaging their backs and legs. Of course, in reality, the effigies merely allowed the living to comfort themselves, nothing more. This paper head probably belonged to a shadow god. Shadow gods, as the name implied, were like hired thugs, which people said could protect the dead so that they wouldn't be bullied by evil spirits or crafty underworld magistrates, and so that the paper money their descendants burned wouldn't be stolen by some impish ghost. The paper head must have originally been attached to a large, formidable paper body. Someone must have pulled it off and tossed it onto the street. The hair on the paper head was as black as crow feathers, and each strand was quite lustrous. Ocean reached out his hand and felt it, discovering that it was glued tightly to the paper skull, as though each strand had truly grown out of it. The craftsmanship is exceptionally good. Could they have glued real human hair on here? He pondered. Suddenly, a slim black shadow flew past him. The shadow behaved strangely, rushing past his side, then disappearing in an instant into the thick fog. The chin unsheathed itself and pursued it, before swiftly returning to its scabbard. The thing that had passed so close to him moved too quickly. No human could have run so fast. Be careful, prepare, Lanongji said. Even though whatever it was had only brushed past, it was hard to guarantee that it wouldn't do something else the next time. Getting up, Weoshin said. Did you hear that just now? Footsteps and the sound of a bamboo pole. Correct. During that brief moment, other than the footsteps, they also heard another strange noise. Tap, tap, tap. It was clear and crisp and sounded like a bamboo stick being rapidly wrapped against the ground. Why there would be such a noise, they didn't know. Just then, in the middle of the blinding fog, footsteps echoed once again. This time, they were very light, very slow, varied, and many in number, as though a whole crowd of people were cautiously approaching, but without uttering a single word. Ryawishin pulled out a seal of flame and tossed it lightly in front of him. If something brimming with resentful energy was before them, it would ignite and illuminate a patch of ground. The ones approaching sensed that someone had thrown something in their direction and suddenly took up arms, immediately counter-attacking. A myriad of swords flashed ferociously toward Wei Wuxian and Lan Wangji. Calmly, Bi Chen unsheathed itself, swooped in front of Wei Wuxian and beat back all of the attacking blades. Their opponents fell into disarray after suffering the crushing defeat. Hearing their noisy shouts, Nanangji summoned Bi Chen back at once. Jin Ling, Sidre, Wei Wuxian called. Sure enough, he hadn't heard wrong. Jin Ling's voice sounded somewhere within the white fog. Why is it you again? I was just about to ask the same thing, Wei Wuxian said. Lan Sidre's voice was full of admiration, though he tried his best to restrain himself. Young Master Mo, you're here as well? Then, is Hang Wang Jun here too? Upon hearing that Lan Wangji could be present, 
and afraid for his life of being punished again, Jin Ling immediately shut his mouth as though someone had cast a silencing spell on him. He has to be here, then Jing Yi shouted. That was Bi Chen just now, right? It was Bi Chen, right? Hmm, he's here. He's beside me right now. Come quickly, Wei Wei Xin said. The herd of youths, now knowing that they were facing friends, not foes, sighed in relief as though they had just been pardoned of some huge crime. Every single one dashed over and circled around the pair of adults. Other than Jin Ling and the Lan Juniors, there were also seven or eight youths wearing other clan uniforms who were still hesitant. They were most likely also disciples from fairly high-ranking backgrounds. Why are you all here? Wei Wishin asked. It's a good thing Hong Wang Jun is by my side. What if your ferocious attack had hurt an ordinary person? There aren't any ordinary people here, Jin Ling protested. There aren't any people in the city at all. Nan Sitre nodded. The weather is clear and sunny, but this eerie fog is still everywhere. Plus, not a single store is open. Let's not worry about that yet. How did you guys meet up? Don't tell me you planned to come here and night hunt together. Jin Ling never found anyone to his liking and had an unreasonable and quarrelsome temper, and there had previously been friction between him and these Lun juniors. How could they possibly have planned on night hunting together? Lun Sidre felt compelled to answer and began to explain. It's a long story. Originally, we were... Just then, clattering noises echoed through the fog. The sound of the bamboo pole hitting the ground struck their ears with abnormal force. Frightened expressions stole across each of the juniors' faces. There it is, again. <laughs>